a series of startling photographs taken by one of the most controversial figures in the world of UFOs. Could these be legitimate photos of flying saucers, or are these the works of a hoaxer? While many disagree on their authenticity, they define the movement of the UFO contactees and their message of world peace. As researchers dive deep into the story to separate fact from fiction, new evidence may lend credence to the story of meeting a man from Venus. Welcome to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Eli Watson. I felt that the best way to begin today's episode was by being fully transparent. The topic of George Adamski, who I will be discussing today, is an extremely complex one. This is a man who rose to international fame due to the popularity of one, his story, and two, the photographs of the flying saucers that he took. In, he was investigated by the government, by the FBI, by Project Blue Book, warranting a 300-page report. And he cultivated a group of followers who, quite frankly, did not stop believing in his story, even after it was seemingly debunked. My biggest question when looking into this was, why? What made this man so special? that he was able to cultivate that kind of following. And as you'll see, there's a lot of different things happening in this story. I found out about George Adamski in 2019 while doing an episode for my podcast, Cryptid Campfire, where we discussed Project Blue Book. You know, George Adamski was one of the many cases that Blue Book investigated. But what struck my attention about it was Adamski's home base was Palomar Mountain which I've discussed in this series before. From where I live in Temecula, California, I can see Palomar Mountain, and I can see the observatory on top of the mountain. And the idea of not only flying saucers being seen around Palomar, but possibly the best photographs of flying saucers ever being taken at the base of Mount Palomar really, really caught my interest, and I had to know more. So, while doing this series, the first UFO-centric episode I did focused on me kind of uncovering this old UFO cult that existed in my hometown of Temecula. And the leader of the Olympian Society was Everett H. Lee. And he mentioned in one of his books that he had contact with interplanetary beings. And that sounded a lot like George Adamski's story. And with the two being so close together, I thought it was about time to revisit George Adamski after finding out just that little nugget of information about him while doing my podcast. What this gets into is the greater contactee movement of the 1940s and the 1950s. This is very, very different than the modern day discussion we have about UFOs, which is all centered around UFO abductions and government conspiracies. Instead, this was kind of the dawn of modern ufology, and it featured a lot of friendly contact with people from outer space. I don't want to get too much into that. I'd rather just get straight into the story that George Adamski told that happened to him in 1952. By the time this story begins, George Adamski was already 55 years old. He was a Polish-born man who lived at the base of Mount Palomar at this place called Palomar Gardens, uh, where he lived in this kind of communal setting, and one of those people was a woman named Alice Wells, who ran the Palomar Gardens Cafe, and George Adamski helped run that, and that's kind of what he was doing when everything started to happen. For this episode, we partnered with My Heritage. 
they sent me the DNA testing kit, which was super easy to use. I just used a Q-tip to collect some saliva, placed it in the receptacle, and sent it off to the lab. I knew it was going to take a couple of weeks to get my results back, but in the meantime I was able to upload old family photos to my family tree so I could put a face to the name. MyHeritage also has some really neat photo restoration features, including colorization, removing scratches off photos, and one of my favorites is actually the ability to animate faces using their deep nostalgia technology. Alright, it's time to find out what my ethnicity is. 36% Mesoamerican. Wish I could say that was a surprise, but uh, yeah. 31% English. Nice. Oh, 11% Scandinavian. Nice, all my Norwegian brothers, what's up? Basically 11% Iberian. Spain. I am both the colonizer and the colonized. This is incredible. Honestly, that's really cool though. To see it broken down that way by region, uh, I think is really cool. Lots of mixture happening here. If you want to find out what DNA is floating around in your body, go to myheritage.com and use my promo code MONSTERS for free shipping and start a 30-day free trial of MyHeritage's best subscription for family history research. And enjoy a 50% discount if you decide to continue it. You'll be able to uncover the secrets of your own DNA. Now, to help me tell this story in full, I decided to reach out to the person who runs the Georgia Damsky Foundation. Glenn Stecklin. His family has a history of working with Georgia Damsky, and then after Adamski's passing in 1965, has helped carry his legacy into modern day. My family, along with others, worked with him to promote the exposure of this subject in a reasonable, logical, rational manner. And because of our dedication and, and loyalty to that, he confided in us more so than he had done to any of his previous co-workers. So Adamski was fascinated with astronomy. He had two telescopes, uh, both Newtonian reflectors. One was a 15 inch telescope, which I learned very early on while doing research. 15 inches does not measure how long the telescope is, but instead measures the diameter of the lens. <laughs> so 15 inch telescope is actually quite large. In that 15 inch one, he actually built a wooden kind of encasing for it so it was like a miniature version of the observatory that was at the top of the mountain. The telescope in the Palomar Observatory is 200 inches and was actually the largest in the world up until 1975. The other telescope Adamski had was a 6 inch telescope that he kind of left mounted out in the open. It was a lot smaller than the 15 inch, he was able to move it around more and is a very integral part of this story. So in 1946 was the first time Adamski makes the claim of seeing a flying saucer. It was to the south of Palomar, so towards San Diego, and he claimed it was a large black cigar-shaped craft. He didn't know what to make of it. He thought it might be some kind of aircraft. World War II just ended the year prior. So there was a lot of new technology at the time and someone like Adamski might not have been aware of the new aircraft. So he thought that's what it might be. He claims later that government officials came into the Palomar Gardens Cafe and discussed it with him and then asked him for help in photographing some of these flying saucers in which he photographed two in front of the moon. However, when Adamski gave them copies of the photographs, they cut all ties with him. They got what they needed, I guess, and then moved on. I'll get into this more later, but George Adamski was actually pretty well known for lecturing at different venues around Southern California. And in one of these lectures, he mentioned he had photographed saucers for the government, of which they staunchly denied the reports and 
that's the kind of beginning of that schism there that ends up growing over time. However, despite the fact that they cut all ties with him, that did not deter him from photographing UFOs whenever he saw them in the early 1950s. Because Adamski was talking about these flying saucers so regularly, he kind of became a point of interest. People would visit the Palomar Gardens Cafe to talk to Professor Adamski about these flying saucers. And he would share what he knew, which was limited at the time. That is how he met two couples, uh, the Baileys and the Williamsons, who become an integral part of the next portion of the story, which is November 20th, 1952. So in his book, The Flying Saucers Have Landed, that he published in 1953, along with co-author Desmond Leslie, Adamski mentions that he had heard reports of UFOs landing in the desert. That's when he got the idea to start traveling out to the desert, one, to see these flying saucers, and two, in hopes that he would get to witness one land, and possibly even meet the inhabitants of one. George described it as that there was a lot of activity, and, and these... UFOs were reported in the San Diego Union and some other of the other magazines. So he decided to collect his people and go out in the general desert area to see, uh, you know, what they could see. Calling the Williamsons and the Baileys, he decided to meet the four of them in Blythe, California. He himself left Palomar Gardens with Alice Wells, who I mentioned before, and his secretary, Lucy McKinnis. They met in the late morning, they had breakfast, then they headed out in the desert towards Desert Center. And about 10 miles down the road on uh, Highway 8 along 178 towards what's called the Coxcomb Mountains, there on the corner they parked and he set up the six inch telescope and he noticed a cigar shaped craft in the sky along with smaller individual saucers. It was silent and it was huge. Then they started to hear plane motors coming across the desert. And after a short while, these planes started to circle around the large cigar-shaped craft and perform maneuvers around it. Afraid that they were gonna lose it, Adamski asks someone to drive him up the road towards this thing. So Lucy and Al Bailey hop in the car with him and they drive him about a mile and a half down the road, where Adamski thinks this is where they should stop. Curiously enough, when they stop, the cigar-shaped craft stops with them. They get out of the car and they help Adamski set up his six-inch telescope, which he had brought with him in case they saw flying saucers. But I did not want to waste too much time with these preparations because I did not know how much time I was being given. I felt a definite need for haste, but as I think back over my experiences, I'm not sure whether this feeling was coming from those in the big ship or being created by my own excitement. I told Al and Lucy to get back to the others as quickly as possible and for all of them to watch closely for anything that might take place. As the car was turned to obey my instructions, the big spaceship turned its nose in the opposite direction. Silently but quickly, it crossed above the crest of the mountains and was lost to my sight, but not before a number of our planes roared overhead in an apparent effort to circle this gigantic stranger. A few minutes later, Adamski, who was now alone, sees a smaller craft descend from the sky. And as rapidly as possible, I snapped the seven loaded films without taking time to focus through the ground glass in the back of the camera. But I was hoping and praying all of the time that Lady Luck was with me and that the pictures would turn out well. Adamski takes these film holders and places them in his right jacket pocket. As the flying saucer disappeared, Adamski brings out his Kodak Brownie camera and he starts taking photos of the landscape, hoping to capture the scene of where he saw things in case the telescopic images did not turn out. And he noticed that down the ravine came walking an individual, a fellow that was about, what, five foot seven? in a copper kind of jumpsuit, so, uh, sandy blondish hair, kind of Mediterranean features.
As Adamski approached the man, he felt uneasy about it. He didn't know who this person was. He thought it might be a prospector of some kind because he didn't see another car in the vicinity. Suddenly, as though a veil was removed from my mind, the feeling of caution left me so completely that I was no longer aware of my friends or whether they were observing me as they had been told to do. By this time, we were quite close. He took four steps toward me, bringing us within arm's length of each other. Now, for the first time, I fully realized that I was in the presence of a man from space, a human being from another world. And I was so stunned by this sudden realization that I was speechless. My mind seemed to temporarily stop functioning. I felt like a little child in the presence of one with great wisdom and much love. And I became very humble within myself. For from him was radiating a feeling of infinite understanding and kindness, with supreme humility. Adamski reached out his hand for a handshake, but the visitor declined. Instead of grasping hands as we on earth do, he placed the palm of his hand against the palm of my hand, just touching it, but not too firmly. I took this to be the sign of friendship. The flesh of his hand to the touch of mine was like a baby's, very delicate in texture, but firm and warm. So Adamski decided to try to speak to him and asked him where he had come from. However, the visitor shook his head, implying that he didn't understand. And then Adamski resorted to telepathy. So to convey the meaning of my first question to him, I began forming to the best of my ability, a picture of a planet in my mind. At the same time, I pointed to the sun high in the sky. He understood this and his expression so indicated. Then I circled the sun with my finger, indicating the orbit of the planet closest to the sun and said, Mercury. I circled it again for the second orbit and said, Venus. The third circle I spoke, Earth, and indicated the Earth upon which we were standing. I repeated this procedure a second time, all the while keeping as clear a picture of a planet in my mind as I was able to perceive, and this time pointing to myself as belonging to the Earth. Then I indicated him, with a question in my eyes and my mind. The visitors seemed to understand what Adamski meant by all these motions and of course the telepathic communication and repeated the motions back to Adamski. So he circled the sun once and then twice and stopped there and then pointed to himself indicating that he was from Venus. The next question Adamski asked this interplanetary visitor was why he was coming to Earth. The visitor assured Adamski that their coming was in fact peaceful, but they were concerned, however, about the nuclear emanations coming from the Earth. And this was in direct reference to the nuclear weapons that had just been invented. This was seven years after the end of World War II and after the pretty intense bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. He must have received an impression that our visit was drawing to a close and that he must return to his waiting ship, for he kept pointing to his feet and talking in a language I surely had never before heard. From his talk and his pointing to his feet, I felt there must be something very important there for me. And as he stepped to one side from the spot where he had been standing, I noticed strange markings from the print of his shoe left in the earth. He looked intently at me to see that I was understanding what he wanted me to do. Then motioning for me to come with him, we turned and walked side by side toward the waiting ship. The splendor as it flashed its prismatic colors in the sunlight surpassed every idea I had ever had about spacecraft. A beautiful vision in actuality. The answer to many questions. A long cherished hope realized. For here before me, silent in the desert stillness and hovering as if poised for flight, this ship of unearthly construction waited our approach. The very realization of the experience I was having overwhelmed me, and I found myself speechless. No longer was I concerned with Earth alone. Rather, it was more like living in two worlds at the same time, and though I should live to be a hundred years of age or more, 
I shall never forget the joy and the thrill of my first close approach to a scout ship from planet Venus, a sister to Earth. However, as they got up close to the craft, Adamski had a bit of an accident. And he got actually a little too close and he got pulled in on the side of his arm a little bit. According to his account, Adamski's right arm went completely limp and stayed that way for three months. And he was worried about the film negatives that he still had in his right jacket pocket. He was worried that the electromagnetism had messed with it in some capacity. The visitor from a different world notices them and asks for one. And so Adamski gives him one right off the top. And with that, the visitor steps away behind the craft, so Adamski never actually saw how he entered the craft. He gives him one last wave, and then the craft takes off and flies away. As I stood in this mountainous recess, a solitary man watching the beautiful scout ship glide silently over the crest of the mountains and disappear into space, I felt that a part of me was going with it. For strange as it may sound, the presence of this inhabitant of Venus was like the warm embrace of great love and understanding wisdom, and with his departure I felt an absence of this warm embrace. As for the footprints the visitor left behind, Adamski went back and photographed them. Alice Wells made a sketch of the impressions that were in the sand. And Dr. Williamson, who had Plaster of Paris with him, casted the tracks. After doing all of that, Adamski and his friends drove to Phoenix, which was the closest large city, where they reported what happened. And Adamski submitted his telescopic images to the paper as well. It was reported in the Phoenix Gazette, as well as the Oceanside Tribune, and it kind of started to take off. And uh, the story went viral. Uh, it hit the newspapers. And then Desmond Leslie, a British nobleman who was writing a story about the history of flying saucers in a way that uh, what we now call ancient alien theory, included George's story in the second half of his book. And Adamski became a uh, international celebrity. He was invited to give lectures all around the world. That was really the beginning of Adamski's meteoric rise. However, the story that he tells isn't over just yet. A few weeks later, after November 20th, on December 13th, while back home at Palomar Gardens, Adamski was visited once again by a flying saucer. This craft come flying, low level, a treetop, and there's a picture of it, and stops and drops a bundle. And everybody look, watches it and, and witnesses it and takes off. And Adamski went and retrieved the package, and it was the film plate that he had given to Ortho. They developed a plate, and it was covered with strange symbols that were actually very similar to the symbols on Orthon's shoe. Now, certainly, there's a lot of questions from this story. I didn't even go through it in full exhaustive detail because even more questions are brought up and I don't want this entire episode to be questions and answers about Adamski's story. But one thing to note is that by today's standards, the story might seem pretty tame. No one was maliciously hurt, there was no evil aliens, the greys didn't show up, instead these otherworldly visitors are coming in peace. They look just like us, and they have our best interest in mind. However, at the time, it was completely fresh. Adamski was one of the first to come out and say he knew why they were here, and people were ready to latch onto that. One thing is undeniable about Adamski is that his story resonated with people. And I think to understand that, I think to understand the full scope of Adamski's influence not just in the world of UFOs, but in the world as a whole, we need to really examine what the state of the world was like in the late 40s and early 50s. The UFO scene in Adamski's time, in the early 50s, was pretty nascent at that point, because 
The modern UFO era only began in 1947 with the Kenneth Arnold sighting and the Roswell incident and the, you know, the Mantell incident. Various UFO stories that really captured the public imagination. And so you combine that with the increasing technological prowess that was going on industrially at the time with space travel, rocketry, uh, which were still in their very early stages in the early 1950s. People didn't really understand what space was. We didn't have satellites. We didn't have, you know, Hubble didn't exist. So we didn't know what Mars was really like. It may have been inhabited. Um, we didn't know what Venus was like or Saturn, at least on a public level. Maybe the scientists did, but on a public level, people didn't really understand that. I think the point Patrick is touching on is really important too, because the largest and most important observatory in the world at that point in time was the Palomar Observatory. 200 inch telescope first saw light in 1949. With it, scientists were able to peer further into space than they ever had before. That's when we discovered quasars and supernovae, the discovery of dwarf planets and the controversy that surrounds that discovery was a result of the Palomar Observatory. That was in more recent years. It's, it's why we don't consider Pluto an actual planet anymore. <laughs> Additionally, the first successful space probe, the Mariner 2, which flew around Venus, didn't successfully orbit the planet until 1962, three years before Adamski died, and 10 years after his encounter with the alien in the desert. The Mariner 4, which photographed Mars from space for the first time, didn't happen until 1965. We didn't land on the moon until 1969. The concept of space exploration in the late 40s and early 50s was very, very new. So while the scientists may have had their ideas that might align with our modern understanding of the planets, certainly the public did not. That kind of information wasn't necessarily disseminated out like it is today. On top of that, the flying saucers are being seen more and more frequently during this time. The summer of 1947, following Kenneth Arnold's sighting, really kicked off the UFO craze. It was known as the Summer of Saucers. It was followed by the events of Roswell later that year. Uh, I think the Mantell incident in Kentucky, the Aztec UFO crash in early 1948. I mean, you have some significant events in UFO history occurring in that year. So while you have all these saucers being seen in the sky, what you have is people combining the real life experiences of people and older space travel narratives. Well, the, to set the scene, um, people thought about space a lot. Uh, there were there had been stories about space for, I mean Jules Verne was talking about it in the 19th century. So going back a lot of ways, but space stories, space opera, goes back to the late 20s, and so ever since after that point, we have space stories and very popular and dozens of magazines that specialized in space stories by the 40s. In fact, there was one called Planet Stories, which was specialized in space opera and was very popular. And it's one of the magazines that we still remember because of the cover art. One significant event that occurred years prior to Adamski's arrival on the scene was in 1938. It was Orson Welles' radio broadcast of War of the Worlds. If you don't know, Orson Welles became a famous Hollywood director, director of Citizen Kane, a famous actor as well, and he recorded in 1938 a dramatization of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. It's in a breaking news style fashion that I really think is cool. It sounds like you're listening to some kind of music radio station, and then it's interspersed with these breaking news reports of, oh, this thing landed, we don't know what it is, oh, it's opening up, oh, they're aliens, they're vaporizing people. It's honestly a lot of fun to listen to, that got super famous because of the media frenzy that followed it. People were tuning into this and thinking that it was actually happening. And while the actual panic that people were experiencing is, is highly debated, what is the truth is that the media went after Orson Welles saying that he was 
out to cause a stir, he was out to cause panic, get more popularity for his show. And who knows, maybe he was, I, I don't know. But my point in bringing that up is that this is kind of a sign that some people were really willing to accept the existence of people on other planets. So it was on people's minds, for sure. I don't know the, the temper of how many people would have believed there were UFOs, but I think that when Kehoe's book came out, this, I think it was The Saucers Are Real, it was from a True Magazine article, he posited that these flying saucers were from outer space and it may be aliens. And we don't take, we take that for granted now, but it wasn't taken for granted when that book came out. Flying saucers were new to the zeitgeist. They were interesting. They were fun. People wanted to talk about it. You had uh, movies about it. Day the Earth Stood Still. Earth versus the Flying Saucers. That was a little bit later, but in the same general era. And space travel was becoming an interesting topic. So people looked at UFO sightings. They weren't even called UFOs then. They were flying saucers or flying disks. And they looked at these things as something fascinating. In the late 1940s is when the U.S. Air Force, right after the Kenneth Arnold sighting, began studying the UFO phenomena based on primarily national security interests. But it's also a time of sci-fi movies. And we have science fiction flying saucer movies and invasion movies and so forth. So as part of popular culture, the UFO phenomena really uh, began in Hollywood as well. So it's part of our, our uh, past, part of our interests, and that invasion idea was a prominent thing. And you know, you can go back to the War of the Worlds and so forth. It really became center stage in Hollywood back in the 1950s. That same time, we had a, a phenomena develop called the contactee phenomena, in which various individuals would talk about encountering objects and having long range relationships with aliens and occupants of these crafts. And they became known as contactees. The contactee phenomena was really the dominating UFO narrative of the late 40s and throughout the 50s. People were coming forward saying that they had met the occupants of these crafts. Usually it had some, usually they looked just like us, they were peaceful, they were friendly, they were looking out for us. There's an exchange of information, a large focus on spiritual growth, and uh, there's also a strong undercurrent of planetary protection be it an ecological message. Frequently in the 1950s and 60s, it was a nuclear message. They wanted us to disarm our nukes because of the threat that it would cause to the planet. But beyond that, on a more personal level for the contactees, it was a, a very spiritual thing. It was focused on self-actualization and growth. The beings that they met with frequently came from within our solar system, Venus, Mars, Saturn, and the like. Uh, and sometimes it was uh, from planets that were nearby, but you know we didn't know about, like Clarion or Lanulos. Adamski was really the ultimate contactee. It's hard to discuss the contactee movement without bringing him up, because the image of the flying saucer landing in the desert and Orthon, which is the name he gave to the interplanetary visitor, is just so perfect. It, it, it encapsulates everything about the contactee movement in one go. And although Adamski was not the first contactee, he was certainly the most influential of all of them. And that leads me to my question is why? There was a bunch of people claiming similar things to Adamski and certainly Adamski knockoffs after he got so much fame, but Adamski still maintained that top contactee spot and I, I'm just wondering, like, why? And I think it has to do with his first book, The Flying Saucers Have Landed. So Desmond Leslie was an Irish aristocrat. He was a playwright, an author, 
the second cousin of Winston Churchill. The list goes on and on about Leslie. In fact, you could do an entire documentary about Desmond Leslie because that dude led a really, really interesting life. When The Flying Saucers Have Landed was published in 1953, Desmond Leslie and Georgia Damsky had not yet met. In fact, I'm not even sure if they knew who the other was, which seems really strange on the surface considering they co-wrote a book together. However, prior to Adamski's encounter with Orthon, Leslie had written a manuscript on the history of flying saucers. This really seems like the kind of beginning of the ancient astronaut theory as we might know it. Reading that first chunk of the flying saucers have landed is, is almost like watching an episode of Ancient Aliens. It's talking about Vimanas and, you know, floating craft used in Atlantis. I mean, the book is out there, and to think that it came out in the 1950s is actually pretty wild. As far as I know, this is also like the first book to propose that the Bible itself refers to UFOs several times. The problem Leslie was facing, however, was that no one wanted to publish the book on its own. Why that is, I am not entirely sure. However, when Adamski had his experiences, he made a written statement, which wasn't very long about everything that had happened to him. It wasn't long enough to be a full-length book. So it was a publisher named T. Warner Laurie who remembered Leslie's script and decided to combine Adamski's manuscript and Leslie's manuscript to make The Flying Saucers Have Landed. So what you have is the first two-thirds of the book is this really dry facts and dates and numbers about UFOs and how they've been visiting the world. And then it perfectly leads up into the present day, and that leads into George Adamski's manuscript, which is his encounter with Orthon. Adamski's portion of the book is written completely different than Desmond Leslie's portion of the book. Adamski's portion of the book sounds like he's telling a story, and he gains the trust of the readers by opening his portion of the book the way he does. I am George Adamski, philosopher, student, teacher, saucer researcher. My home is Palomar Gardens on the southern slopes of Mount Palomar, California, 11 miles from the Big Hale Observatory, home of the 200-inch telescope, the world's largest. And as he tells about his sightings and the events leading up to November 20th, it all sounds very relatable and very believable. I wish I could pinpoint exactly what it was that makes you want to trust him. There's this almost ineffable quality about the way Adamski writes through its simplicity and without the big words that, that makes him all the more endearing. One of my favorite passages in the book actually has almost nothing to do with UFOs. I also feel like it encapsulates this feeling that I've tried to express on this show a few times before. Night after night I stayed outdoors watching the heavens. The stars sparkled in friendly brilliance during the long winter nights and the winds roared over the mountaintops, sounding like heavy freight trains rolling down a steep incline, or like the clatter of an approaching streetcar on metal rails in the city. Then as nearby trees bowed before them, the cold winds wrapped me round and seemed to penetrate to the very marrow of my bones, and steaming cups of hot coffee were incapable of warming me. Once I caught such a cold that it took me many weeks to recover, but still I persisted. The saucers were a challenge and I could not stop, but there were wonderful nights too when the air was warm and summer skies sparkled overhead. The breezes in the treetops whispered melodies and an occasional bird asleep on some branch would waken, twitter a moment and return again to the silence of slumber. Often during the spring and summer nights an owl would break the spell of still beauty with its hoot, and then an answering hoot, sometimes close by, sometimes far away. Coyotes, too, added their sharp barks, especially during the nights of the full moon, and almost instantly the night air was filled with answering barks and bays of the mountain dogs, who will not be quieted until the yaps of the coyotes have ceased. Yes, there have been nights of magic to recompense for those of discomfort as I continued my watch for the mysterious saucers. And I think that's what made this resonate with so many people so much. 
and, and maybe this played into it as well is that the average Joe picks up the book you're instantly hit with a bunch of facts and dates and numbers from Leslie's portion of the book and then you skip over to the back and look at Adamski's portion it's immediately relatable it's a person telling you a story and maybe that worked to the book's benefit as well but I think the primary reason his message resonated was because of the atomic bomb After the war, and people saw the devastation that this weapon had, that it had the capability uh, in a full-on conflagration uh, to destroy the entire planet. And I think people felt that they were looking down the barrel of a loaded gun that was aimed not just at them, but all of humanity. And they felt completely powerless to do anything about it. So along comes Adamski with this message of, peace and love and harmony and it was non-discriminatory everybody was equal and that was a very appealing message for people but the thing that he also brought was this uh enforcement angle because you had the space brothers um it's one thing to just say hey live in peace and harmony and, and disarm your nukes and it's another to have aliens who have such a higher degree of technological advancement that they can disarm our nukes for us. They can stop us from destroying ourselves. So they're not just bringing a message, they're giving us the means to actually deliver on that message. I've touched on it a little bit already, but the dawn of the nuclear age was a change that I don't think anyone alive can really relate to. The idea of world leaders being able to take the lives of not just one or ten or thousands of people, but millions of people in an instant is unfathomable. And all of us, everyone here alive, pretty much has grown up with that constant threat looming over our head. And it's, it's at the point to where it's like, if you grow up with the ever constant threat of being instantly annihilated, does it even feel like it's there? This concept, our indifference to it in a way, is not what they were experiencing in the early 50s. So when Adamski comes out with the flying saucers have landed and there's this message of hope, the hope for unity and the hope that we could all lay down our weapons and live together in world harmony, I think that really touched a lot of people who didn't have that hope. And as we'll explore here, but more so in the next part, that is perfectly in line with Adamski's philosophy. And in order to kind of segue into that, let's discuss who Adamski was. George Adamski's story is pretty interesting. Whatever you think of his philosophy, uh, he was a very interesting guy and had a very interesting life. He was born in 1891 in what was then Prussia, now it's Poland. He emigrated to the US at a very young age and uh, from then he just kind of roamed about doing very interesting things. He was in the cavalry in the early 1900s. Uh, he fought against Pancho Villa at the Mexican border. He worked in Yellowstone National Park. He worked at an Oregon flour mill. And in the 1930s, founded an organization called the Royal Order of Tibet, which was a philosophical organization. The Royal Order of Tibet is certainly one of the more interesting aspects of Adamski's life pre-Flying Saucers. Established in 1934, it was a sort of philosophical compound based in Laguna Beach. And as Adamski said in his own words to the LA Times, he was there to teach the scientific portions of Lamaism. Also in the same article, he mentions that he learned a lot at the top of the world. The top of the world is a reference to the Himalayas, the tallest mountains in the world. And that makes you wonder, did he spend time in the Far East? And yes, it, it appears that Adamski actually did spend time in the Far East, in Tibet. Lu Zinstag, later in Adamski's life, who became his international contact in Switzerland and wrote her own book on Adamski, as well as Fred Steckling, Glenn Steckling's father, believe that 
Adamski spent time in Tibet when he was young. There's also an author named Gerard Artson who provides the most comprehensive answer to this question. According to all accounts, Adamski immigrated to the United States with his parents and lived in New York when he was around two years old. Due to financial hardships, he was never able to complete the fourth grade. And this gets brought up a lot when people call him Professor Adamski because he wasn't a college professor or anything like that. But in his own words, the title of professor was given to him by his students starting at the Royal Order of Tibet and then continuing on as he got into the flying saucer world. When Adamski was a child, he met a man named Uncle Sid. Not much is known about Uncle Sid. He knew Adamski's parents, he knew Adamski himself, and later when Adamski's father died, Uncle Sid kind of took over that paternal role. Eventually, Uncle Sid and his wife convinced Adamski's mother to send him to Tibet in order to study with the Lamas, convincing her that the benefits of the things he would learn would be better than him staying in New York. So she agreed, and Adamski spent, depending on which version of the story you read, three to six years in Tibet, and then returned to the United States. There is an implication that Uncle Sid was actually a space brother, knowing what Adamski was here for, way prior to Adamski meeting Orthon. However, there's no way to confirm that. I don't even think there's a way to confirm that Uncle Sid existed. So that's what I have on that. Either way, it kind of completes full circle why his establishment was called the Royal Order of Tibet. If he had spent time in Tibet, he wanted to continue the teachings he had learned from the Lamas on the top of the world. There is one piece of controversy I want to discuss about the Royal Order of Tibet. According to Ray Stanford's testimony, Ray Stanford is another ufologist. He met Adamski when he was a teenager at Palomar Gardens. As the story goes, Adamski told Stanford that the Royal Order of Tibet was a front and that during the Prohibition era, he was making communion wine and bootlegging it to the state of California. And that if it wasn't for Roosevelt changing the law, he wouldn't have had to get into all this flying saucer crap. Online, if you come across this quote, people kind of use it as like, oh, slam dunk, case closed, Adamski was a fraud, he had a history of performing fraud. However, the one thing that doesn't add up, and even in Stanford's own testimony, prohibition lasted from 1920 to 1933. And if he didn't start the Royal Order of Tibet until 1934, then certainly there wouldn't be a need to bootleg liquor. So the circumstances surrounding that situation are very, very strange, but I did wanted to bring it up because I think that is an unnecessary criticism against Adamski that is like widely available right on the Wikipedia page. Once you start to think about it, it really doesn't hold up. However, it's also known that Adamski was not a fan of President Roosevelt. I'm not sure why. Adamski is very, very private about his political leanings, but there are several references that he did not like President Roosevelt for whatever reason. So it was at the Royal Order of Tibet in Laguna Beach that he first met Alice Wells, who, as I mentioned, was the owner and operator of the Palomar Gardens Cafe and was with him on November 20th, 1952. And it was with Alice Wells that George Adamski and his wife moved from Laguna Beach down to Valley Center and then ending up settling in Palomar. And that's something else. This is a little known fact about Adamski was that he was actually married for a time. And why this detail is so hidden, I am not sure. The best theory I have been able to find on it was that she was a devout Catholic and really didn't approve of him speaking with the Space Brothers. After she passed away, Adamski felt like he was freed to do what he wanted to do and just never chose to speak about her. However, she's not mentioned in his books. It's, it's very, very strange why 
she's almost this forgotten figure, whoever this Mrs. Adamski was. Exploring more into Palomar Gardens, it doesn't take very long to find that Adamski did not own the property that he actually lived on. It was actually Alice Wells. Having been in the Far East and the Royal Order of Tibet and knowing what I know about his teachings, Adamski does not strike me as a materialist person. So it kind of makes sense that he wouldn't own the property and that that would fall to Alice Wells. So George never owned these properties. He was merely a guest, so to speak. And the same thing was in Valley Center and Mount Palomar. Uh, these properties were owned by Alice Wells and they built and refurbished these properties. They built their cabins. They opened a school. In this case, when the Mount Palomar Observatory was being constructed, it was Alice who decided that they should make a cafe available for the people who were gonna come and see this, the tourists, not only that, but also the people who were doing the construction and eventually the astronomers who would man the facility as well. And so this became a meeting point, a focal point for all these people. Uh, they'd come down and they would talk astronomy with the Damsky. And he was something of an amateur astronomer himself. That brings us around to where this episode began with the story of him photographing UFOs and then meeting Orthon in the desert. I think that provides the perfect segue into a closer examination of the photographs. I want to preface this with a few statements though. What I'm about to go through and analyze is by far not a comprehensive or exhaustive way of analyzing these photos. This is going to be a fairly quick analysis. If you are so inclined, there are hundreds if not thousands of papers written on the analysis of the photographs because it's just an insane list of people saying that here's why they're real, here's why they're fake, here's why some are real, here's why some are fake, and I'm not going to be here to say that they're real or fake. What I'm going to do is I'm going to present the facts that I came across. And I'm going to point out the things that I think are legitimate and point out the things that I think are suspicious. But I also want to touch on that the main thing I'm going for here is that the authenticity of the photos matters far less than the legacy and the impact he had on ufology. It stands to reason that here we are 70 years later and we're still debating whether or not these photos are legitimate or not. I think that alone is a statement in and of itself about the impact Adamski had on this community. So with that all out of the way, let's begin. So starting off with the first images he took on November 20th, in his accounting, Adamski took seven shots with his telescope as the flying saucer moved past him. These seven photographs were submitted to the Phoenix Gazette. The Phoenix Gazette said that only one of them was usable and Adamski subsequently ordered the destruction of the other six. I'm not gonna lie. It's hard to tell what you're looking at in the photographs from November 20th. I'll be using these upscaled and enhanced versions of the photos done by Rene Eric Olson in his book, The Georgia Damsky Story, Historical Events of Gigantic Implications. He cleans up these images in a way that makes it easier to see what we're looking at. I also wanna say Photoshop didn't exist back then, so there can be no doubt that what is there in frame was actually there in front of the camera. And whether or not these were models or actual aircraft is what is the source of the controversy. And looking at the only telescope image, it's almost impossible to tell whether it's a model or an actual craft. There is nothing in frame to compare it to size-wise. Absolutely nothing. So that's what that one is. Could this be a model set far away from the telescope or is this an actual craft? That leads us to the brownie photographs. As I mentioned before, Adamski, after taking the telescopic images, switched to taking photos with his Kodak brownie camera. 
What's interesting about the brownie photographs is that Adamski never brought them up. He never talked about them other than saying that he took them. I mean, to me, that's a mystery as to why he would deliberately leave those out. The first Kodak brownie image appears to show just a landscape with nothing in it. However, after Olsen's examination and upscaling and cleaning it up, it reveals that there's these two bright spots up in the sky. I don't think they're stars, considering that it's midday. I don't think it's the moon, considering that there's two of them. I'm not sure what they are. And upon zooming in and enhancing the images even more as far as he can, they appear to be saucers, much like the telescopic image reveals. And upon darkening the sky, he reveals that there is a large cigar-shaped craft in the sky, which, you know, coincides with his testimony. If those are models, I don't know how he got them up in the air. This photograph I don't see discussed very much at all. Maybe because prior to Olsen's examination, it was very difficult to make out in the sky because it's, it's incredibly overexposed. And so you just can't really tell what you're looking at. It just looks like a shot of the desert. At this point too, I want to bring up a Project Blue Book report. This report was sent to me by Glenn. It confirms that there was a cigar-shaped craft investigated by military pilots over the Salton Sea on November 20th, 1952, at roughly the same time Adamski would have seen it. Of course, according to Blue Book, this was nothing more than just a rogue weather balloon, but knowing Blue Book's motive during this time, which was to debunk all flying saucer reports, it makes sense that they would say that. So if this is true, and there was a large cigar-shaped craft floating over the Salton Sea, which was about 10 miles away from where Adamski was, then this goes a long way into helping to confirm at least some aspects of Adamski's story. Now, let's look at image two, which is another landscape image. There's a peculiar outcropping from this hill. As Olsen upscaled and enhanced the image, it reveals that it is yet another craft. Now, at first glance, it looks like a craft that's far away from the camera. What I want to bring to attention is the foreground of the image. It's blurry. Now, this requires a little bit of explanation of how the Kodak Brownie works. The Kodak Brownie has a fixed lens that's set to infinity. What that means is it's a lot like your iPhone to where it just captures everything in focus all the time. Well, now phones are a little more complex to where you can play with the depth of field and have some stuff in focus, some stuff out of focus. But what you will notice is that if you place an object too close to your camera lens, it will be out of focus because it can't focus that close to itself. So the blurring of the foreground of the second brownie image, you would expect to be the result of the ground being too close to the camera. What I'm saying is there's a case of forced perspective here. What we're looking at could very well be a model that's closer to the camera than we think it is. Take a look back at Kodak Brownie image one, where the foreground is not blurred. That's what you would expect if someone was taking an image standing up. But if someone was down or the camera was down closer to the ground, it might blur the foreground. I want to take a look at one of the photographs of the footprints that they got. And you can see the blurring in effect because the camera is low to the ground and the foreground is blurred, much like it is in Brownie Image 2. So I'm going to follow this train of thought here. If it is indeed a model that we're looking at, what is it? And to answer this question, I'm actually going to jump ahead in the narrative to the December 1952 event in which Adamski photographed the flying saucer hovering above Palomar Gardens. These photos are a lot more clear than the ones in the desert, and they very clearly 
fully in focus show images of a flying saucer, what appears to be a flying saucer. Additionally, another gentleman living on the compound with the Damsky was a man named Gerald E. Baker. He took a photograph with the Kodak Brownie. This is known as Baker's photograph. But if he's taking the photograph with the Brownie, again, the, the aspect of focus comes into play here. Background with the oak trees is in focus and the craft itself is not. However, if the craft was hovering just below the tree line, as it appears to be, the craft would still be in focus. The only way an object can be out of focus on a Kodak Brownie is if it's too close to the lens, which again makes one think that this could very well be a model very close to the camera. As for the other photographs being so perfectly clear, people have tried very, very hard to debunk those. What people settled on as the primary piece of the model is the top of a 1930s Coleman lantern. These are some comparison images I've been able to find online, and I'm not gonna lie, it looks a lot like Adamski's flying saucer. Of course, Adamski would have added some stuff to it in order to complete the look of the UFO. However, I would be remiss if I did not include the rebuttal to this argument. The rebuttal is the idea of the graying effect. Essentially what that means is the farther something is away from either the human eye or the camera, there's less detail, there's less definition in the contrast between the highlights and the shadows, essentially flattening the image. The reason for this is because of the layers and layers and layers of the air, the actual atmosphere, and the particles in the air. And this is not some weird, you know, made up argument to try to prove that these are real. This is, this is an actual effect. It's, it's why the mountains appear hazy at a distance is because of the miles and miles and miles of air that I'm looking through causes it to look that way. And that's evident in these telescopic images of the craft in December of 1952. And as far as I know, that is impossible to fake. Certainly back then, it would have to be further away from the camera. So again, it still could be a model that is set far away from the camera, or perhaps it is an actual craft that is far away. But stick with me here because there's still more strangeness happening with these photographs. Let's circle back to the brownie photos. The third image of the brownie photos, this one we have not yet discussed, and this is the last photo Adamski took before he met Orthon. This time, the foreground of the image is not blurry. It appears to be just a landscape. And in Olsen's upscaling of the image, it reveals something almost startling, which is the figure of a person. And as Olsen did as much as what he could to the image, it reveals more or less someone that matches Orthon's description. What we're looking at I am not entirely sure. This could very well be Orthon. And maybe that's the answer to the mystery of why Adamski never discussed the brownie photographs because it revealed Orthon. It's very possible Adamski snapped this photo, didn't realize Orthon was in frame, and when he developed the photo and saw that Orthon was there, decided not to bring up that evidence in respect to his friend. I also want to add that it is impossible for me to conduct my own analysis of the photos, as much as I would like to. Olsen was given access to the original negatives of the photos, and from that he was able to bring out the most possible detail. What I have are reprints, scans, they're not the actual negatives themselves, and without that, I'm unable to replicate Olsen's process, which is something I would actually really, really like to do, because I'm not the type of person to just accept someone else's analysis of a photograph, even if it seems legitimate, which it does. 
Olsen seems very transparent with what he did to the images and makes it easy for someone to follow along if they have access to the same materials. George offered a $5,000 reward if anybody could disprove his pictures. It was never claimed. If you go on our website under the George Damsky page, you will find the statements of John Ford, the Hollywood producer, uh, the guy named Mansoor, who is the model producer, and they all said that these pictures are not fakes. And you cannot fake the graying effect of a telescopic shot. So when you look through the telescope and you see the ocular like you can in George's picture, and you see the uneven background graying effect of that atmosphere, you cannot fake that. Impossible. Not only can you not fake it now, but you sure as hell can't fake it then. We didn't have Photoshop. We didn't have computers. We didn't have all the means on which we could uh, fake uh, material. And today, a lot of this stuff is fake. So what happened is, is people made accusations. Oh, this was a lamp. But if you look on our website, you will see that the Coleman lamp has been measured in relationship to the craft and the dimensions are completely different. Not even close. Then they call it a chicken brooder. Well, you go look that up too. Not even close. So basically what you have is you have people who flung out accusations but never provided the substance of their statement to prove it was actually fake. Because they couldn't. Because it was never fake. When you look at those pictures, you know damn well it's never been fake. It's impossible. And so John Ford, the producer, he said, well, if it's a model, it has to be a full-scale model. About 33 to 35 feet in diameter to be able to build such a thing and suspend it and be able to photograph. He says, it's, 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 we couldn't even do it with our Hollywood budgets. How the heck is this guy living on the mountain going to do that? It's unbelievable. So people can accuse anything they want. And my word to them is prove it. And that's where they all peel off to the wayside. <laughs> For me, as I dig deeper and deeper into it, it becomes more and more difficult to say whether it's real or whether it's fake. For me personally, it gets even harder in the topics I'll be discussing in part two, because, I mean, if you think this is complicated, just, just wait till then. Before I end this episode, there is still one more thing I want to discuss, and that is the footprints that Orthon left behind. Orthon, left behind footprints for Adamski to photograph and cast. As you can see in the photos, these footprints are quite unusual. Alice Wells drew a sketch of them, and this is the sketch here. And when the film holder was returned to Adamski in December 1952, there were strange markings left on the film plate. As you can see, the markings on the plate and the markings on the bottom of Orthon's shoes resemble each other. As for what they mean, I am unable to decipher them. The, the deciphering of that, it, along with the symbols of the footprints, are a key to discovering the propulsion system of the spacecraft. And the interesting caveat is it. In 1963, over 10 years later, an anthropologist from Belgium by the name of Professor Marcel Homé is in the Brazilian jungle. And he finds an area where the locals are calling it a taboo and sacred. And it's called the Piedra Pintada, or the Painted Rock. And on that painted rock are the same symbols, almost 80%. The Piedra Pintada which was discovered by Marcel Homé, is also a source of controversy. Marcel Homé's book, which was translated into English and then published in 1963, was 10 years after Adamski's The Flying Saucers Have Landed. And Adamski's fame being what it was, it is not hard to imagine that Homé might have read Adamski's book, and decided to add on to it, giving his book further publicity than it probably would have received without it. 
I'm not saying one way or another. Perhaps Marcel Homais' book is completely factual and helps to prove Adamski's points even further. Or maybe it's the other way. And Homais was trying to piggyback off of Adamski's success. But like I said, prior to my very, very quick analysis of the photographs, Adamski is more than the photos. Adamski is more than the story he told. Adamski was a movement. He was a legacy. He was the dominating force of the UFO field for nearly a decade. His story deserves to be told. His message about people from outer space coming down to look out for us and hold us accountable for our actions really, really resonated with people. The idea of a long-haired human-like alien coming out of a flying saucer and talking to people is still integral to the idea of what we think about when we think about aliens coming from outer space. You know, if we're not thinking about the greys, we're thinking of Orthon-like aliens. And that is because of George Adamski. And as we barely touched on in this episode, his beliefs and his teachings inspired people to follow him and still inspire people to follow him to this day. And his transparency about everything that happened to him really went against the direct contrast of what started to happen in the 1950s with the government and the cover-ups and the conspiracy angles all starting to come out around that time. I really, really hope you guys will stick through the next episode because I think it's going to be really, really exciting. And with that, that's it for this time, and I'll see you in the next one.